short. Good morning and welcome. Please stand with me as we begin to worship with a reading from Psalms 33, 1 through 8. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the water of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in the storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank 
crown of thorns to mark your name. Forgiveness fell upon your face. In a love like this, the world had never known. On the altar. Never been anyone like you. You are the 
continue to worship with the reading from Isaiah chapter 53 verses 1 through 6. Uh, before I read that, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that there's something different about this morning in the worship, and I feel it in my spirit. And Matt gave me a word that he was feeling in his spirit, so I'd just like to pray that over the congregation. Um, one of the songs we were singing was saying that your shame is undone. So perhaps there's somebody, you know, here who is feeling embarrassed and ashamed of how they're living or something is going on in their life. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus over your embarrassment and over your shame and let you know that God loves you and is willing to receive you. Uh, no matter what you've done and how you've lived, his unconditional love is here for you this morning. So if that word speaks to you, we would invite you to come up after service and receive some prayer. But God loves you and you are welcome into his family. So we'll continue to worship with a reading from Hosea uh, chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the word of the Lord. So welcome to church, Riverstone. You may be seated as you greet a neighbor. And the middle school can be dismissed. All right, the mission of this church is to be a people who are declaring and delighting in the beauties of Jesus. If you're a guest, welcome. We're glad you're here. And we have a few announcements for you. Uh, number one, we are baptizing folks on Sunday, February 25th um, as part of our church service. And nobody's excited about that. 
Okay. Good. Uh, if you, if you want to acknowledge uh, what God is doing in your life, or if you've re recently started following Jesus, or maybe you've never been baptized and want to publicly declare your allegiance to Jesus, please register online and let us know, and we'd be happy to baptize you and get you wet. Uh, announcement number two, we want to put our money where our mouth is when it comes to saying that we believe in the presence and power of God among us. So we're creating a space Sunday nights to gather and pray and seek God for this church and community because we want to be a people saturated in prayer. And we'd love to have you. So tonight from 6 to 7, uh, we'll be here. Uh, it's also a place where you can come and receive prayer. Uh, so whether you're full or empty, we'd love to have you. So tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, number three, we have a regional men's retreat coming up March 8 through 10. All right, four people are going. If you registered, uh, we'll be getting more in information to you ASAP. If you haven't registered, there's still one week to register. So if you're a guy looking to get more connected in relationship, we encourage you to jump in and register. Uh, you won't regret it. And this is not on the announcements, and I don't even find them out there. But if you recall, Chris had announced a few weeks back. There they are. Uh, Clint and Amy, if you would please stand up. Please stand up. I, I, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So, oh, wow. You, you guys aren't even going to let me talk. But Chris had announced, you know, that Clint has, was having some, some medical issues. So the church just gathered, and we prayed. And I'm so excited to see Clint and Amy here today. So you guys already gave them a round of applause. I want us to just give them a loud round of applause and just love them. And we're glad you're back. We, this is a true testament to what prayer can do. So we thank God for just rescuing you and bringing you back. And we just look forward to working with you in the future, Clint. Thank you very much. Be real gentle with Clint, y'all. <laughs> Uh-oh, you better turn that down some, Sean. My feedback. Hey, good morning. So for those of you who aren't aware, Clint had a heart attack, pretty serious one, um, just a few weeks ago, and he's back in action. So uh, we're happy you're here, dude. Um, glad you're here. Uh, my name's Chris. I'm the teaching pastor here at Riverstone. If we've not met, let us shake your hand. Uh, I'm going to read the scripture that we're going to jump into, and then I'll pray, and then we're going to go for it, yeah? Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open to 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. And it goes a little something like this. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie. Don't, don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And not only that, but the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But listen, listen, y'all. If we say we have no sin, maybe we deceive ourselves. Truth's not in us. But on the other side, if, if you confess your sins, dude, he's faithful. He's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. But y'all, if we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word's not in us. Let me pray for us. Father, we just invite your presence to be made real to us in this room. God, I pray specifically today that the love of God, your love, would be made real via the power of the Holy Spirit in some hearts this morning. God, hearts right now that are alien to your love, they're outside of your love. God, would you come, would you reveal to them the depths of your love for them in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this passage in 1 John is really a remarkable passage, especially if you think about the cultural Christian landscape that we find ourselves in over the past couple decades. Um, American Christianity has been associated with uh, figures like Tammy Faye Baker and Jimmy Swaggart. If you're unfamiliar with those names, just Google them. You're welcome. Um, basically, a kind of Christian that projects a plastic perfectionism in various degrees, either under layers of makeup and hairspray or layers of money and pinstripe suits. Um, in the 80s and 90s, y'all, the Christian template was God is good. 
I'm fine, you're fine, everybody's fine because we have to be fine, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> huh? Am I wrong? Anyone who grew up in the 80s? Okay, or I'm a child of the 80s, big fan of the 80s. If you became a Christian in the 80s or 90s, you were like the most Christian, says Nate Bargatze. Um, that was a template, y'all. It was. Smile. Everyone's looking, you know. While in reality, we're rotting from the inside out, eaten up with lust and bitterness and anger and greed and all the things, right? But put a little more hairspray on and praise the Lord, brother, right? Now, we can all relate to that. We all know that's a real thing in Christian circles. And we know that, and that it doesn't just exist on the stage at the, the high-profile level. But what, had, what has it produced other than high-profile leader after high-profile leader crashing and burning in moral failure? Because as soon as they established an identity as a Christian, right, as soon as it was like, I'm going to do this Christian thing, or even more, I'm going to be a leader amongst Christians, they started thinking this thing, I can't be honest anymore about my struggles. i got to act like I've got it together now. I've got to act like I'm above that stuff. People are looking at me, and they stopped being honest, y'all. They stopped walking in the light. They stopped walking in community. Uh, they repressed the darkness inside them and never actually dealt with it. And darkness always, always catches up with you guys. It always catches up. And it finally caught up with them, and we all watched it in horror and shame. And you can name several high-profile Christian leaders probably right now off the top of your head that have had a plight like this, where they've reached high levels of success and their influence, the top of their influence, think of a tree, their influence grew higher than their roots grew deeper. And they toppled over under the weight of their own success, right? And this happens in Christianity all the time. We become a Christian, we think, I'm going to do the thing, and we start managing our image. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? You don't know what I'm talking about. Managing our image. Okay? So, so when, the, when, the, when the pastor says the thing, you're like, oh, we say amen. We say, right? And when the chorus and when the, you know, oh, this is when everyone, okay, everyone's good. Now we're good, right? And what Christianity becomes is a long exercise in image management. And we're learning the whole time not how to deal with darkness, but how to hide it, right? And darkness always catches up with you guys. Now, now listen, okay, super fun, take swings at high-profile Christian moral failure. Like, super fun. Who, like, like, small groups for that, right? Everyone goes, it's like, it's like, it's like when you're, like, a pinata. Like, everyone loves hitting a pinata. Candy comes out of it. That's literally how we think about this. Like, let's go take some swings. Here's your turn. <laughs> right? Right? Look, look at him now, you know. Let's, and I'll tell you what, now, some of us enjoy it a little too much. Some of us enjoy a little too much pulling people down back into the muck and mire, don't we? It's like a jolly rancher, you know. Whack, oh, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> They're no better than us, you know. Um, but this impulse that I'm talking about to appear more godly than we really are, it runs through us all, dude with a mic included. Not just on the religious days. I mean, I mean, it's human instinct to want to be more desirable than we really are, right? And when you're a Christian, when you're in Christian circles, being more desirable means being pious, being wise, being learned, being holy, not dirty and sinful. And you read the right books, you listen to the right music, right? And when you're hanging out with the church kids and some gnarly, dark desire bubbles up in you, we're like, oh, no. What am I? What I what, what, what was... I thought I was a Christian. And we, guys, look at me. We don't know what to do with it. We're hanging out with church kids. We know we're not supposed to have desires like this. We're not supposed to do things like that. That's sinful and gross. And we don't know what to do with it. And the easiest thing that we do with most Christians, we just stuff it back down. Right? And our whole Christian life becomes a game, a whack-a-mole. You ever play that one? Right? <laughs> I'm going to start sweating up here if I keep this up. <laughs> Whack-a-mole. Get back down there, you know? Nope, can't do that. Can't think that, right? And y'all, when our whole Christian life becomes about repressing and hiding how we really feel, number one, there's absolutely nothing attractive about that. And number two, according to Scripture, when we are hiding, when we are just playing whack-a-mole with our sins so no one sees it, we cut ourselves off from truth. We cut ourselves off from community. And we cut ourselves off from the cleansing power of Jesus. That's what we just read. Whack, 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 right? I got this under control. 
I also have a very low hum feedback going on. Anyone picking that up? You want to fix that for us, Sean? When I say this impulse is running through us all, I mean the impulse to hide the ugly realities of our heart, to brush it under a rug, to not face it, to not call it what it really is, to not confess it, to leave it in darkness, undisturbed, unchallenged, let the sleeping giant lay, pastor, right? And the scripture in 1 John, y'all, is dealing directly with this impulse in Christians, He says, if we say, if we claim, we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. Key word, walk. Key word is walk, y'all. That means repetitive cycle of hiding. Walking is something you do one after the other. Right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. It's repetitive. It's not, I'm not not just talking about, oops, I messed up one time and dealt with it. It's over and over and over again. And when we aren't, when we, when we walk, when it's a repetitive pattern, he says, we're lying to ourselves. So think about it. Gossip or anger or unforgiveness or arrogance or lust. When these things become a pattern in your life and when you refuse to acknowledge it, he says, you're a liar. We lie and do not practice the truth. What an interesting phrase. Practice the truth. Did you know that you needed to practice the truth? Like practice, you know, like practice soccer or cheer or Dungeons and Dragons or violin or singing or whatever you practice, right? Y'all, practicing Being a person of truth means, in this context, it means someone who acknowledges truth about yourself. That's this context. Being a person who practices truth means that you're practicing acknowledging truth about your, this is what this is talking about. Being a person who does not hide who they really are. Y'all, being a person who does not hide who you really are takes practice. Welcome to church. When Jesus says, hey, you got to become like a child to enter the kingdom. You know that one? You gotta become, if, you don't, if you don't become like a kid, you're not going to get in the kingdom. You know Dallas Willard, he says, one component of being childlike is this. Children don't use their bodies to hide how they feel. A child is you clearly know what a child is feeling, don't you? They've not learned how to hide what's going on inside them yet. They've not learned social cues. They've not learned things like this. And so when they're upset, they're upset. You see it. When they're angry, you should see my three-year-old. Good Lord. When she's angry, like the whole neighborhood basically knows, right? No, when kids feel things, you see it immediately. He's, Dallas Willard says, for Grown-ups, for many people, growing up is simply learning to use your body to hide. He says, for many people, that's simply the process of growing up. We've just learned how to hide what's going on inside of us with our bodies. Y'all, being a person of truth takes practice. Practice. It takes, and practice implies you don't get it perfect every time. Practice implies you're going to screw up all the time. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. That's why you got to practice acknowledging the truth about yourself. It's a long process, y'all. Listen, I'll get a truth bomb for you. You're more sinful than you ever dreamed or imagined. And you are more loved than you've ever dreamed or imagined. In those two truths, if you call yourself a Christian, you will spend the rest of your life never plummeting the depths of the realities and the implications of those two truths. That you are more sinful than you ever have dreamed or imagined, and you are more loved than you have ever dreamed or imagined. Being a person of truth and practicing this takes dying to your ego over and over again. It means refusing. What does it mean, y'all, to practice truth? It means refusing to participate in those white lies that seem to slip out without our permission. Like, you're not a liar for heaven's sake. You just forgot to do that thing at work. And when they asked you, you freaked out because you didn't want to look bad. You didn't lie. You know, it's a matter of job security, Chris. You want me to lose my job? You want me to lose my job? You want that? I had to lie. But I'm not really a liar. I just, you know, it just slipped out. And, you know, it's fine now. I did it. I did it after, you know. Y'all, practicing the truth is really hard. And it implies you don't always get it right, but you keep practicing. And there's, a, there's an undercurrent to this whole thing. And that we find ourselves drifting towards darkness. 
And if we do nothing, y'all, lying becomes a normal part of our life. Listen to me. I'm telling you the truth right now. I love you. Unless you make a serious personal commitment to be a person of truth, you will drift into deception. It takes a serious personal commitment, right? You have to practice confronting the darkness in your own heart. Y'all, it's what Christians call confession. But most of us, even when we confess, if you have a structure in your life where you confess to people, if you're anything like me, you leave out the most embarrassing bit. Like, I'll confess 80%, so they get the general idea of what, really, of what went down. But, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell them you know, what really happened because that would be embarrassing and I'd, you know, they'd think less of me. Generally, we confess about 90%. We, we, we accept about 90% of responsibility. And uh, often uh, Christians think, sometimes Christians think that really uh, all I have to do is acknowledge my sin before God and then I'm good. You know, I'm, I'm in no way going to harpoon my reputation and tell my buddy what really happened. Uh, but listen, James uh, 5.16 says this, confess your sins to one another and you will be healed. It doesn't say just acknowledge it in your heart. My old chorus teacher said practice does not make perfect. She said practice makes permanent. In other words, when you practice truth telling, it becomes a part of who you are. You become an honest person. Congratulations. But if you practice deceit, eventually you just become a liar. It becomes a permanent fixture of who you are. Practice makes permanent. So one of the ways that I try to practice truth, just I'll give you a snippet real quick, is by inviting men that I love and trust to ask me pointed questions about my life. At our last men's retreat, which was a year ago, I gave a list of these very pointed questions. I said to the guys, these are the kind of questions that I need to be asked. Um, these are the areas of sin and temptation for me, and I will not normally volunteer information if I'm not doing well here. I need to be asked. And I gave it to them, and I said, I welcome you to add to this list. And I challenge you, and you're like, all of you are remembering that. You're like, oh, I totally forgot about that. Um, <laughs> and I said, I dare you to give it to a buddy and say, ask me these questions once a month. None of you did it. It's okay. <laughs> but one buddy told me, he said, you know what needs to be added to this list? He said, are you hiding any purchases from your wife? And I was like, ooh, yeah. Yeah, that needs to be added to this list. Y'all, it's easy to begin practicing walking in darkness. And when my buddy said that, I was like, I didn't even know I was hiding that. Right? To practice, what'd you say, Gary? No. Yeah, well, you know, that's it, though, isn't it? Right. To practice the truth, y'all, at some level means we subject ourselves to relationships, accountable relationships with brothers and sisters that love us enough to ask us difficult questions. Because look at what it says. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. See, apparently this whole walking in the light thing opens up uh, the possibility of true community. If we're not in the light, it's not a possibility, bro. It makes sense if you think about it. Outside of the light, outside of grace and forgiveness, when our value is based solely on our performance and our behavior, of course we're not going to be honest about our failure. Of course we're not going to be fully known. But if we're in the light, if the Father is full of love and grace and forgiveness, walking in the light doesn't just mean acknowledging your sin. It means being set free from it. And if that's what's on the table, if, if what I get is sin losing its grip on me, sign me up, dude. Like, let's go. Look what it says, because let's keep going. If we walk in the light, he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But, he's, you notice what's happening? He's repeating but if, we say we do not sin, if we, we, but if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his words not in us. Twice, he says, he'll cleanse us. He's faithful. He'll, he'll, he'll forgive us, cleanse you from all sin. Twice, he says that, cleanse you from unrighteousness. Twice, it says, but you got to admit it. 
You, have, you can't say you have no sin. If you're walking in sin, you're a liar. You're deceiving yourself, right? It's remarkable to me, y'all, how rare and uncommon it is among Christians to actually deal with their dysfunction openly. It's actually quite rare. Let me just ask you a question point blank. When was the last time someone confessed sins to you? When was the last time you confessed your sins to someone else? Many of us can't even remember because it's just not something we do, right? And it's only when the acid of our sin is eating through the veneer of life will we ever even consider dealing with it. But look at what is at stake, y'all. Not only is authentic community at stake, but experiencing the cleansing power of Jesus is at stake here. You catching this? It says, if you walk in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us. But if we say we have no sin, if we deny the existence of it, we're living in a delusion. Y'all, Jesus said only the sick need a doctor. Now, as I've said before, this does not mean that our Christian birthright is to be continually sick and sinful. Our birthright as a Christian is to be transferred out of the kingdom of sin into the kingdom of God. But when Jesus says, only the sick need a doctor, he means if you are unwilling to acknowledge the embedded sin and dysfunction, if you are unwilling, if you are constantly parading around as if your sin is not there and projecting some pretend version of yourself, he says, I cannot heal you. If we say we have no sin... We live a lie. Now, let's talk about it. It's like this. It's like the doctor comes to you and says, all right, you got stage four, 100%, stage four cancer. This is, you're going to die. This is going to eat your body. You're dying quickly right now as we talk. You're dying. However, surgery can remove this one. You can be healed. I can get the cancer out. You will walk with a limp for the rest of your life, but I can do it. The doctor says, you need to give me access to the cancer way down in there. You're going to have to bear yourself. I'm going to have to cut your body open, lay down. You're going to have to be naked and exposed, but I can take this out. And the patient says, no, I could never be laid out and vulnerable without neck, without covering. You want me to take, you want me to take my clothes off? How shameful. I'm a stand-up. I would never allow myself to be seen like that. And secondly, who do you think you are to call me sick? Because the reality is, y'all, some of us would, and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I know it doesn't. The reality is some of us would rather die than be seen as sick or unable or exposed as broken or sinful. We would say, I will take death over that. I'd rather die than my image be destroyed. It's remarkable that even when healing, full, did you catch it? Full cleansing, all sin, even when that is on the table because we cannot admit our sin or we're too afraid of the vulnerability required to make us well, we prefer sickness to health. We prefer isolation to community. We prefer death to life. Y'all, in this passage, the great physician is promising, I can heal you fully from all unrighteousness, but it will require nakedness and a scalpel. And you've got to admit the reality of your sickness. And we say, I'm fine, thanks, I'm good. Right? Y'all, this is harder for Christians than it is for non-Christians. It's why Jesus said the prostitutes and the sinners are getting in the kingdom before y'all. The impulse to appear more godly than we really are runs through us all, dude with the mic included. And underneath it, I believe this. I believe most people just haven't squarely reckoned with the implications of sin. All right? Let's just reckon. Let's just think about this for a second, then we'll be done, okay? Um, I don't think we've realized what it means to live in a fallen world, amongst the fallen people. I really don't. I think that truth just kind of like, okay, whatever, yeah, everyone's sinful. I mean, I guess maybe. I mean, obviously you look around and things are horrible, so you're like, well, I guess that makes sense. But like, you know, I'm not sinful and like pastor's not. I mean, look at him. He's up there preaching the Bible, right? <laughs> We've underestimated what sin has done to us, y'all, all right? Um, when it's everyone out there, you know, how sin plays itself out in society. Think about that for a second. Everyone out there, when sin plays itself in society, in organizations, in politics, in business, in social circles, we, we, social, social circles, thank you. We've underestimated 
what sin has done, but we've also underestimated what it's done in the cavities of our own soul. Yes, it's out there, but it's in here too. And it has serious implications. And it's my conviction that we routinely drift away or perhaps choose to overlook one of the foundational truths of humanity, which is this. Everybody's broken. Everybody's broken. That is how you spell it. I Googled it because I was like, is that how you spell everybody's? And that is. It is correct. Everybody's broken, y'all. The somebodies and the nobodies. The powerful and the powerless, all broken. I am broken. You are broken. Or as Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately sick. Who can understand it? We seem to forget this in our life. We seem to overlook its implications. Let's just think about it in two areas. If this is true, out there and in here. What happens when we forget that others are broken? And what happens when we forget that we are broken? Let's just deal with it for a second. Start, let's start with out there because that's much more fun. When we forget, y'all, that everyone out there is broken, we tend to have a naive idealism about people, organization, and even politics. Just let that settle in for a second. When we forget that everyone is broken, we tend to have a naive idealism about people, organizations, and politics. We develop blind trust a gullibility, and lack a clear-eyed view of accountability in relationships. Which, for many Christians, we can fall into this category very easily because they think, well, God loves everybody in that he does. But they think that means everybody must mean well and everybody must be worthy of love. Guys, that's not the same thing. They think, well, God loves everybody. Therefore, well, everybody must be worthy of love. Therefore, I don't need to lock my door at night. Large corporations definitely have my best interest in mind. Right? Listen, y'all. God loves everybody, but it's not because they mean well. God is not like you who have to pretend that others are worthy of love to love them. God does not have to whitewash the world to love it. God loves us in full view of our depravity. In our sickness, y'all, he is not like us. He doesn't have to pretend you're better than you are to love you. That's what we do. That's what family does. That's why they never deal with conflict. Because they think, you have to be worthy of love for me to love you, so I'm going to brush it under the rug, and I'm going to pretend like you're awesome, and then we're going to get on fire. That's naive love, y'all. That's not the love of the Bible. That's not the love of God. God loves you in full view of all of your sins and shortcomings. Come on, man. That's the gospel. Somebody going to say amen or something like that? Gary, where are you at now, bro? Come on, man. Like, back me up, man. Like, we know we ought to be loving, right? I got to be loving. How am I going to love this riffraff? Well, I'm just going to pretend like, no one's, like everyone's awesome. That's naive love. That's adolescent love. That's teenager love, y'all. That's like 16-year-old fell in love with a total loser. And you're like, dude, I don't want to tell you. He's a bum, right? But okay, go. you know what I mean? It's immature love. The love of God loves you deeply in full view of your dysfunction. He loves you anyway, y'all. Many Christians think, oh, well, I only, I'm only going to give love where it's deserved. Well, God loved you, so you got to fit that in your theology somehow. God is not immature in his love. Dude, I mean, that's, I mean, that's, come on, that's so good. Number two, when we underestimate the implications of brokenness out there, we tend to think, stay with me, We're getting deep here. We tend to think life should always be happy. Where do you get that idea? Where do you get the idea that life should actually be good? It's actually a a, a very difficult philosophical problem for for, uh, secular people to to, to to reckon with. Think about it. All we've ever known as humans, all humans have ever known, is suffering and sickness and death. We've been dying since the beginning. We've been getting sick since the beginning. People have been getting eaten by lions since the beginning. And yet, we have this idea deep in our hearts that life should be happy, that we were made for something more than suffering and death. Where'd you get that idea? Because the Bible is going to, yes, called the Garden of Eden, right? That's what the Bible is going to say. The Bible is going to maintain that all suffering and death and sickness, even natural disaster, is a consequence of sin. That's what the Bible maintains, y'all. 
So that's a, that's a nugget you got to think about for a while. But what we don't often realize is that while all suffering and death and sickness is a consequence of sin, it is not always our own sin. This is what the book of Job is dealing with. Job, you ever read the book of Job? It's a righteous man, someone who God himself says is blameless and upright, who suffers horribly. In the entire book, his friends are saying, you've sinned, you've sinned. That's, that's why you're suffering, you've sinned. Duh, everyone knows that. And he hadn't, it's clear. He hadn't sinned. And the whole book is helping us understand that living in a broken world means the implications of sin in the world means that now death and suffering is the default. Therefore, Christians should never be surprised at suffering. 1 Peter 4, 12, don't be surprised at the fiery trial you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. See, we often treat suffering and death as the exception, which is why we are so angry at God when it happens. We talk, we chat in here? When someone dies, is it not a faith crisis for so many people? When someone gets sick, is it not a faith crisis? Okay, well, we treat those things as exceptions, but sin, y'all, the implications of sin means suffering and death is the default now. And I believe you know it's true deep in your heart. Y'all, because of sin, to live is to suffer. And something deep inside us says, yeah, that makes sense. Now, as Christians, we don't resign to suffering, but we understand, y'all, that any joy, any delight, any pleasure we experience here is mercy and grace because sin has saturated the world, and therefore suffering and death has saturated the world. And it's why, according to Jesus, repentance is central to entering into life. Primary. Why? Guys, think about it. Think about it. Don't leave me. Come on. Stay with me. Hey, hey. Why are those who mourn blessed? Why does Ecclesiastes say the heart of the wise is in the heart of the mourning? It's because everyone's broken. And it's because we live in a broken world. And to not acknowledge that is foolishness. So Jesus would say, blessed are those who mourn. What is he saying? He's saying the world's broken. Everything's broken. And if we don't, if we're too plastic and perfect to lament the suffering of the world, we are, we're truncated Christians. Guys, sympathizing and entering into the suffering of the world has been the call of the church ever since Jesus entered into our suffering. Christians don't whitewash the world. That's why in Isaiah 59, again, he says, he who turns away from evil makes himself a prey. What is he, what is he talking about? He's talking about the fact that we live in a broken world, and that has implications. To do what is right now often has serious negative consequences. Y'all, we've underestimated what living in a fallen world means. Now, even though we don't often realize the implications of living in a fallen world, it's pretty easy to see it out there for sure, right? What's harder for many Christians to see is in here too. Let's sit with these implications, and we'll be done. What happens when I forget I'm broken too? What happens? Well, most obviously, number one, uh, you become harsh, unsympathetic, unloving, uh, and you have no patience with people and their shortcomings. When you forget that you also are not perfect, when you forget that I need grace, I, need, I mess up from time, when I forget I need grace, I mess up from time to time, right? When we forget that and we live in the, under the lie that I'm, I'm perfect, you know what we do to everyone else? We expect perfection. And, and, and we do it through passive-aggressive behavior, you know, because, like, obviously we're not going to be like, be perfect, right? No, we're just going to, like, snub them and give them the silent treatment, right? right? We become, when we forget, y'all, <laughs> that I am deeply broken, Right? When we forget this, we become people like the Pharisees who lay heavy burdens on others in the name of God and refuse to help them, refuse to lift a finger. Right? When we forget, when we forget that we are broken, we become people absent of the love of God. Number two, when we forget that we are broken too, we stop confessing sin. We stop confessing sin. We do. But because we do still sin, really... <laughs> What we really do is we just start hiding. We start hiding. When we forget that we're broken, we start hiding. First, that's what we read. First John says, if we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. 
But the opposite is also true. Confessing our sin heals us. Therefore, yeah, we stop confessing sin. We stop acknowledging our shortcomings. We start hiding and we stop living in the light. Y'all, stay with me. We're going to be done. Sorry. People's testimonies can tend to have this implied component of their story. You ever, you ever heard people's testimonies? You ever heard this? When people get up and they, they tell what happened, you know? They're like, well, I was struggling in here and I was a no good alcoholic. And, but now I met Jesus and now I never struggle at all. And my kids obey me and my wife cooks better. And I got a, I got a promotion, right? And happily ever after, right? And, and they don't mean to. They're trying to make Jesus look good. Bless them heart. Bless their hearts. But they just kind of imply that like there was this thing in the past and now I am perfect. I like levitate into prayer meetings. Like I got a little pair of wings behind my jacket right here, right? They don't, they don't say that. It's just implied. Can I be real honest with you about my experience as a follower of Jesus? You're like, oh, oh, oh here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I experienced the love of God in some form or fashion. All right, here, here's how it goes for me. I experienced the love of God. I come to church I don't expect it. Maybe I'd come up for prayer because I'm convicted. Maybe it's during worship. Maybe I'm reading the Bible in the morning and I experience the love of God, right? And I throw my life in his hands, okay? I throw it in my hand, everything. I surrender all, Jesus, right? Throw it in his hands, right? <laughs> Christians don't tell lies. They sing them, whatever. Um, <laughs> and slowly, by the end of the day, I start taking my life back up. I lay it all down in the morning, and by the evening, somehow, I'm holding my life again as my own. Oh, wait, I thought I just laid this down. Like this thing about a living sacrifice where I was crawling off the altar, right? <laughs> by the end of the day, I'm in charge again. And I start making stupid decisions again. And I get arrogant or I get lazy or I get tempted or I blow it. Or some form of suffering enters my life, right? Death, there's some sickness, right? And it's two steps forward, four steps back. It's mountaintop experiences. It's my highest dreams fulfilled. And then it's my lowest valleys and darkest nightmares. That's my life. That's how it works for me. I stumble forward and I stumble on the ground. And I acknowledge it and I get back up again. And then I get back up again and then I get back up again. Guys, the only time you're failing is when you refuse to acknowledge that you've fallen. You've got to figure out how to fall forward, church. Not falling isn't an option. Guys, Look around, we're all sinners, every single one of us. And what we mean sometimes, and we, what happens when we start coming to church is we just learn how to hide it. And then people come in with a nonsense like this. Well, I'm going to fix myself before I go to church. Are you serious? How? Like, I'm serious. Like, right, there, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm going to fix myself before I go to church. It's utter nonsense. You know why they think that? Because they walk in a room where everyone's learned how to hide. And they think, is this what it is? Everyone in here is daggum plastic perfect. It's not for me. Guys, my life, the reason I'm still following Jesus is because when I fall, I've said, I'm going to deal with this. I've got to tell someone. And it is an over and over and over thing. It's a misstep and it's a galloping forward. And then it's a misstep again. Then God lights up the sky again and I see the terrain for a second. And then I fall and then I get back up and I get knocked up again. You're never going to get me now. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was, <laughs> I don't know. I shouldn't have a mic. Um, all I'm trying to say, all I'm trying to say is falling is unavoidable. But when we confess it, when we own it, we fall forward. Acting like you don't fall is the only real failure. And, then it, and it gives way to this thing about I got to clean myself up. Y'all, it is absurd if you think I'm up here because I'm perfect. That's ridiculous. Let me just cure you of that right now. But we can all feel that sentiment cleaning, creeping in. I'm going to clean myself up before I go to church, right? You're going to go to church this week? No, I had a bad week. I was a jerk to my wife or whatever. I want to clean myself up. I'll come back next week. You know what we do when we do this? We just allow sin to further build up the wall that the Bible says Jesus broke down. We, recl we, recl we go into darkness. The very thing Jesus came to deal with, we say, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'll deal with it. I'll deal with it. Whack-a-mole, right? When we buy the, when we buy the I got to clean myself up first bit, it really means I got to figure out how to hide my dysfunction better. And what happens is we trade 
real, obvious, socially apparent sins for sins that are easier to hide. <laughs> because everyone's broken, y'all. Some people just learn how to hide it better. Listen, it's not just that we've forgotten everybody's broken, but more important, we forgot that Jesus loves broken people by being broken for us. Look at me. Sin and brokenness is all you ever had to offer him. And he died for you anyway. While we were his enemies, he died for the ungodly. See, what's really happening under all of our inability to admit sin, to confess sin, to own our sin, is not that we don't believe in sin. That's, I mean, most people look around the world and say, no, 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 I believe in sin. It's that we don't believe in grace. That's why we don't own our sin. Think about it. I mean, is it really a hard sell that the world's broken? No. What, what's a very hard sell for many people is that God forgives brokenness. What's a really hard sell for most people is that Jesus loves broken people because we think Jesus is just like us. He just overlooks the wrong. He overlooks the bad. That is not the God of the Bible. His mercies are new every morning. You know why? Because you need them every morning. Right? And if, all, if that's true, it, God, guys, if all this is true, all I have to lose by confessing my sin is sin's grip on my life. Amen. That's all you got to lose, man. You say, well, 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 well but people are going to know I'm a sinner. Dude, they already do. Come on. <laughs> like, right? It's going to ruin my reputation. Bro, no. Listen, if it's in the dark, it still has power over you. Until you drag your demons kicking and screaming into the light of God, they still have power over you. And let me tell you something even more. When you start to realize God loves you, it's not just your demons you drag into the light. You drag your temptation into the light. If you want to grow as a Christian, you got to figure out how to drag your temptation into the light, not just your failures, past tense, but get ahead of your sins and drag your temptations into the light. I'll never forget Mark Rutland said, you know what you do when you're tempted by that dark, horrible, vice, sinful desire that always gets you. You know what you do when that demon comes up and tempts you with that, whatever it is? He says, I love it. He says, you slam your hand down the demon's throat. You pull out its entrails. And you call your buddies and you say, look at the nastiness that was trying to tempt me. You drag it into the light. And if you're ever going to grow as a Christian, you're going to have to learn how to do that. Hallelujah. Get ahead of it and say, bro, listen, I'm being tempted something crazy this week. You've got to pray for me right now. I'm the, the, they're nipping at my heels. And let me tell you something. They're nipping at all your heels. The enemy hates you. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy your ability to be a good dad, to be a good mom. He wants you to destroy your ability to be a good employee. And I'm telling you, None of us are really all that good at it. But if we will learn to confess where we are failing, God can make something beautiful out of the ashes. Hmm? Y'all, Jesus is our help in all this. Jesus was tempted to. I'll end with this, I promise. For real, for real this time. Jesus was made vulnerable too. Jesus literally stripped naked, completely exposed. For all to see his shame. Here's the best, most shocking, most appalling news about this whole business of acknowledging sin. Yes, you will have to be exposed. Yes, your pride will die. And it, it just never feels good. I'm not gonna, it never feels good, okay? But listen, Jesus takes the full weight for us. He's made a way. Earlier, we used the example of undergoing surgery to remove cancer. Do you remember? We said acknowledging our sin is like bearing our and bodies laying on the table bare. Y'all, Jesus was stripped bare. Jesus was made vulnerable to the scalpel. And in some miraculous cosmic mystery, he undergoes the full pain of the surgery in our place. No anesthetics, no pain meds. He takes our sickness onto his own body and offers to undergo the humiliation and pain that we deserve on the cross. Y'all, that's what it means when it says he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. His body broken open, his blood spilt on the floor. He went under the knife so we wouldn't have to, y'all. But if we are not willing to admit sin, 
then we, go, we say, healed of what? So today, we're going to come to the table like we always do. But you have to know, what we do corporately in this room is incomplete, like greatly incomplete. I'm going to pronounce the mercy of Jesus over you while we take the, the communion table. But listen, guys, that's step one, y'all. That's acknowledging it, it in your heart. For many of us, I know after a day like today, you need to find someone that you love and trust where you can unload, where you can say, I'm tired of hiding in the dark. I'm tired of harboring sin and shame and guilt, and I need to get this off of me. And, and what we're going to do in a moment doesn't do that. It says confess to one another. What we do is, is somewhat misleading. It's step one, y'all. Step two is talking, to, getting it out in the open. You have to drag it into the light or it still has power over you. So if you're carrying the weight of sin today and you want to be rid of it, I just want to encourage you. God's laid out the way for us to do that. Find someone you love and trust and drag what's going on in your heart into the light. And if you don't have someone, we'll have people down here that will pray for you. You can come do that today. Let me pray for us and we're going to come to the table. Father, I ask right now, Holy Spirit, you would, through the ramblings of this morning, God, through the worship, through opening your Bible, God, through sitting with your word, God, that you would begin to comfort some of our hearts in this room right now who are living in darkness, dwelling in darkness, deep darkness is what Isaiah says. Father, I pray right now you would begin to convince those in this room who are unsure of your good intentions for them. God, that you love them deeply. God, that you are here to draw them out of the darkness. And God, that your light, yes, it exposes, but it heals. So we just invite Holy Spirit, we invite the healing power of the Holy Spirit to come in this room. God, as best as we know how we open our hearts to you, we pray this every week, Holy Spirit, blow through the temple of this body and blow away the things that have been stealing our joy in you, sabotaging our joy. We confess, God, that the sins we've been clinging to are only sabotaging our joy. So we gladly open up our heart to you right now. So I'm going to give you 15, 20 seconds, man. Quietly in your heart, maybe do business with God for the first time in a long time. Maybe confess to him right now the reality of your life, not some pretend version of yourself in 10 years. God can only heal the real you. So right now, quietly in your heart, I'm going to give you some time just to bring the reality of your life before God. God, you know our weaknesses better than we do. And Father, I thank you for a place that you are creating right now in our hearts that we can come and be fully known. God, I thank you right now that you're calling us out of darkness and into light. And would you make this place, Father, a place of relationships, of love and trust, where we can come and rend our hearts, rip open our chest, and get out the stuff that's been bogging us down. If you've confessed sin before God, I want to I want to just take the first step right now and I want to pronounce the mercy of God over your life. God, thank you that we can come and be fully known before you. Father, and I pray that you to give my friends the courage to take the second step of being healed of things by confessing it to someone else, getting it out into the light. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Communion is open to all who believe, guys. The baskets are on our side just for those who call Riverstone home. It's your opportunity to give to the mission and vision of this church as an act of worship. If you're a guest, please feel no obligation to give. Just come forward and receive. Let's stand and come to the table. And this is how we do it, y'all. We're going to form two lines. going to start at the front. Come forward, grab the communion elements, circle back around to your chair, and then we'll pray together to be dismissed uh, as we take the elements together, okay? So come get them. Go back to your chair. Go ahead.
Praise the one who set me free. Alleluia. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Got the goods? <clears throat> the Bible says, on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, Jesus took bread. And we had to give him thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And we had given thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Guys, when we partake of communion every week, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Let's say it together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. I'm going to read you just a little bit of Psalm 32, and then we'll be done. Because that's, you'll see why it matters, okay? Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent... My bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. God, thank you that if we will have the courage to be honest before you, to quit hiding, you meet us with grace, just like the sunrise meets us in the morning. Thank you, Jesus, that when we open Scripture, this is how we find it. This is who you are. We didn't make this up. Would you come, God, show yourself as the forgiver of sins today in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Guys, if we can pray for you for anything going on in your life, we've got people we love and trust, come let us pray for you. If not, have an excellent week. We'll see you next time.